Hi everyone. So today you're joining me for a bit of a different type of video. The few of you I imagine who are going to be clicking on this, but my friend Elle and I are bringing back the little podcast thing we used to do right, right, right when my channel started to pick up any sort of traction. So it used to be called Reading Rhetoric and Retweets. We kind of want a different name, but I have no idea what it's going to be. I have no idea what the consistency is going to be like because so many people start projects like this and then it never amounts to anything. Um, I'm thinking two episodes a month-ish approximately and then like a couple live streams a month and the content that I'm putting out now. But this is our comeback episode where we are discussing our niche interest PowerPoints. I do my PowerPoint on Girl World and Elle does her PowerPoint on robots and necropolitics, which is kind of based and epic. So that is what we're in for, for the episode. It is very, very long because I went way too crazy on the Girl World PowerPoint, to be honest with you. And suggest anything you want us to talk about down below. This is really an, an example and an opportunity for content that's more true to like who I am as a person, like realistically and getting a little, know a little bit more about me as a creator and as an individual and who I like and what my friends are like because Elle and I are really good friends in real life. So suggest anything down below. I'm gonna start doing this kind of more frequently and I really want to have this as a little kind of side passion project, but do not expect that any other, there will be loss of any other content that I'm normally putting out. So that's all I got going on and I hope you enjoy the episode. Bye. So I know it's been a really long time since we've been here, like two and a half, <laughs> almost three years, probably, um, or two Most years. Anyway, this is L and who's been in my like comments and chats and things as well. A uh, friend of mine in like actual real life. We used to do these videos together. I wanted to bring it back now that I have time. I thought it would be really fun. So I decided that we were going to come back with our special interest PowerPoints because I feel like what a better way to learn about my previous co-host and once again co-host to the currently unnamed previously reading rhetoric and retweets podcast suggest names in the description please we can't decide anything anyway oh, I know. So what I would like though L just so that people can get back on base with like who you are and stuff just like age and general interest why we're in the same sphere something something just a little bit about yourself and then we will get right into my PowerPoint because I already feel like based on the conversations with us beforehand, this is going to be a long conversation on these topics. Hi, I'm Elle. I'm 25. I met Mika because I uh, majored in English in university. I just finished my BA and I took a lot of classes on rhetoric. Unfortunately, my university didn't have specialization for it, but love rhetoric i'm a rhetoric stan i think my twitter bio is that i'm a rhetoric enthusiast <laughs> rather than a rhetoric scholar but technically i am a scholar and a baller i have a good time Slay. Slay. excellent we did a little cosmo and wanda moment for the vibes that'd be kind of cute and fun so all right we're gonna start with my powerpoint because we found out that mine's longer somehow which is insane <laughs> anyway so I'm excited. We're gonna, yes. So we're gonna do. We're gonna start with my PowerPoint now. My, I did this on stream with the besties also already. But like my special interest since twenty, very very early twenty twenty. I'm gonna contextualize this for everyone. So it's it's like January twenty twenty. Take in. You're a sample lady, okay? Ah. <laughs> Not the sample lady. <laughs> You're a sample lady at Sobeys in Waterloo, Ontario. You're for some reason. You are you are put in for an the hours of Tuesday night from three to nine p.m. and there's a bus strike in a in a city of university students. So you see like place. five people in six hours. So you have a wireless earbud in from an off brand off Amazon because you were broke broke, and you're listening to random super long YouTube video essays because you can't change the videos all the time uh, when you're working right. Take in the Right Opinions Amberlynn Reed documentary fits itself in there somewhere. And then you've unlocked this new world, girl world. The shackles have been on ever since. Because I want to share this with all of my loved ones, all of my Squish Gang members, probably my mom later, TBH. And I will also link my PowerPoint in the description as viewable for those who want to use it. Now let's look at my PowerPoint 
Al didn't watch the stream on request and just like I didn't show any spoilers. So this is what we have going on. This is my PowerPoint. Incredible. Incredible. The Nikocado, the Amberlyn Reed, the Foodie Beauty. I don't know the yellow person. We're Who getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> That's the point. I don't know if we could see us or not. So I put me on the same screen that I'm sharing. I have no clue mm -hmm. what happens. If it looks weird in editing, I'll fix it. I don't know. Anyway, this is what we have. A beginner's guide to grow a world. Because I'm definitely a beginner. Mm -hmm. Like you, I, I like am barely scratching the surface of the grow world iceberg. So exactly. I'm excited. These are our current girls. <laughs> this is an Among Us themed slideshow I found on Slides Go, by the way. So... Here are three subsections. We have section one. Who are the girls? I'm outlining each of the four currently most prominent girls. And I'm teaching you a little bit of some of the OGs that are no longer online for one reason or another. Section two, we have the reaction channels. All of the mess, all of the drama. This is Alex's shook um, catchphrase. We'll get to him later. Next. And finally, to sum it up, sum it up, I kind of described the general pipeline that leads into things like Kiwi Farms, because that's actually a really big part of like once you're in the trenches. Oh damn! Section one, the girls. These are our girls. All throughout the years, I'm only going to go into the four detailed in the first slide because some of them are not active anymore. So we've got Amberlyn Reed, the reason the whole community exists. Then we've got Foodie Beauty, the goat. And I'm only saying the goat because the lore is is beyond a human comprehension, I think, for most people. <laughs> like, the lore goes so hard. It's incredible. And I genuinely am, like, so interested in her existence. Anyway, then we've got <laughs> Hungry Fat Chick. That's the one you didn't know. We'll get okay. to her later. We've got Nick Cut Avocado, as we know. We mm. had Life by Jen who actually really have passed away last year, unfortunately, uh, due to what people I gather are is like obesity related disease, like something like that, because she was 600 pounds. She went oh. to inpatient, returned home after inpatient and passed away shortly after, to my understanding. So it was like they didn't work or something happened or something along that line. Mm. Amy's life journey who now people are comparing Chantel to because of the white lady with the hijab thing and the husband and stuff had that same kind of she got caught screaming at her kid in a video celebrating 600 subscribers and also allegedly somewhere in there something about hitting him with a spoon and then ah. I think people started like trying to call CPS on her yeah so she stopped doing videos and everything's gone so Amy and Jen were in it at the beginning. So were the mm. Slayton sisters, which I hadn't here at first, but they transcended so far beyond it that I decided to not put them in. So I put Nikado Avocado instead. Um, Are they the Thousand Pound sisters? Yes. Yes. Okay. The Thousand Pound sisters, they literally have a yeah. video making fun of Amberlynn Reed. Really? Like they were in this. They were in it. Yeah. <laughs> not the girl so, on girl crime. <laughs> Amber Damn. actually mentioned in a recent video she's like I know I've had beef with Amy Slay <laughs> <laughs> so would fight with them like Amber would fight with them and stuff but then like I said Amber was offered a TLC show and I think it was really? supposed to be called Family by the Ton or something but then Amber Lynn which we'll get into a little bit had, had like a really like rocky childhood in foster care her parents were addicts and stuff so she didn't really have like access to her family like that and then mm. I think most people speculate that she didn't do my 600 pound life because they did offer that to her too, apparently. Uh, because there's like the shower scene that you have to do and she just wasn't in it, which is like very fair. Like it's kind of like a weird, like spectacle humiliation thing that TLC does. Yeah. Uh, with that shower very thing. Hot. So I can see why you wouldn't want to do that. Also, I don't know how this is going to record. I don't even know if there's going to be doubles of us. If there is, we'll deal with it and then I'll never do it again like this. So those are our girls. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to introduce each one of them with an iconic quote of theirs at the beginning. So, you oh. despicable <laughs> piece of shit. This comes from a very infamous Snapchat rant where I'm actually going to 
I'm gonna supplement this with random videos sometimes if I need to. Mm -hmm. Amber Lynn 2020 Snapchat rant. She won't copyright you for this? No. Uh <laughs> no. She she needs us just as much as like anyway. So here's the the infamous rant. Pepperoni Peach viewer of the channel. It's out of sync. I don't know why. It's because of how it recorded. I love that she has a butterfly filter on her nose while she's saying this. Yep. Like she and this is just her like going in it's on so how much she hates world. like she hates her audience. Oops. She hates her audience so much. Mm -hmm. Kind of understandably so low key sometimes. But like this is yeah. the um the rant. So this is the rant in reference. I want you guys to know that there is no diagnosis that I want regarding me. It's just crazy that people think that getting a second or a third opinion regarding something where two doctors have said something completely different means that I'm doctor shopping. You guys need to literally do your research and stop putting words in my mouth because when you do that you make the rumors go like on a viral note and everyone believes it but then again that's for your entertainment right that's all part of this process isn't it trying to write Amberlynn's story Amberlynn's truth Amberlynn's narrative trying to create the story of her life that isn't real to suit your guys's entertainment Okay, so the context for that. So I'll, anyway, she just really smug. She got acrylic nails close to this point and decided that, that would be her whole personality was like Jeffree Starcore. <laughs> but the doc, the, the really, really, really sad thing about it is this mm -hmm. doctor shopping thing was her constantly going to ERs instead of actual doctors. And it turns out she had ovarian cancer. Oh, shoot. But because she wouldn't like do it, like like get an actual like, uh, not pediatrician, but you know, like family doctor or whatever they call it in the states. Not a general practitioner. Yeah, GP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I and I, I remember because she <laughs> that makes doctor. me think of Greg Paul. GP's out. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so she um she wasn't like getting like proper GPs, or she would just keep bouncing around, which is a big proponent of what led to like the diet because she was bleeding consistently for like a year or something. Like it oh was like God. she had symptoms. For months, and it was like stage three already or something when it, it was like bad. This was in 2020. And then she, um, she uh, got a full uh, hysterectomy. She's fine now. But people are worried because one, she's still 500 pounds. Two, because it appears the cancer was linked to hormonal issues from severe morbid, like long-term morbid obesity. Uh, and tertiary Lee. They're worried that she's not following up properly because she moved to Oklahoma mm -hmm. from Kentucky in September of last year and she has not had a doctor yet. And when you're and when you're out from cancer, like you need to like check your stuff like pretty consistently. Regularly. Especially when it's like a cancer that was involved with something to do with your hormones, right? Because your mm -hmm. hormones move everything around. Right. So it's one of those things that can spread to other parts of the body was saying that in a recent like video I was watching I think it was like the the last meal that the mythical kitchen I can't remember the name of it but yeah I've been I've watching been... oh my god my brother made me watch those with him we watched they're Andy so good but yeah Hank Green was on it and he said he has to get checked regularly for the next five years even though he's cancer free now yeah. so yeah and everybody's like girl respectfully like because the thing is, she couldn't really do, like, the mm -hmm. MRIs and the proper hormonal treatments and stuff because she doesn't fit in the machines. That's really so bad. awful. It just really, it also highlights, like, issues with, like, the medical care system. Like, I kind of, I kind of. Yeah, there should be specialized that, right? MRIs. Like, yeah. I understand a part, like, I understand the concept of, like, nobody should be 500 pounds. Like, I get that. Okay? Like, in the sense of, like, physiologically, like, it's not really something that, like, you would really compensate for like because let's say you made all the mri machines to fit 500 pounds a big part of it is how close it has to be in proximity to the scan that it mm -hmm. wouldn't work for 98.9 percent of people so i can understand that aspect but there should be like 
in three clinics in the country in the United States, let's say like one in one in the West Coast, mm-hmm. one in the middle and one on the East Coast that has like a 650 pound capacity or something. Because well, like, especially when about people- how many people are overweight too in America. Is it really one percent? I'm at 500 pounds. Right. Like, because because you can get up to 400 fit in the machine, which is a pretty good. Oh, that's like a pretty decent margin. You know, it's yeah. but it, it is something where it's like when people are that big, if you have lumps, tumors, things like that. It's like especially like even just reaching them to notice them. You know what I mean? Like if I had a lump on, like, let's say, like the under my left thigh, like above, below my booty or something. Right. Like I can reach like that really easily. But Amberlynn has like really severe lymphedema and lipedema. It's like to get around for one, but also just like because of the lumpiness of the cells already. I don't know if you notice, right? There's new obstacles that come mm. up that prevent more of those signs that you notice when you're smaller. So I feel like you would need those machines. You know, it's like there shouldn't they don't necessarily they shouldn't necessarily put them in all the hospitals again because I don't know if it would work for like straight sized people or whatever, but or even most plus size people, but there should be like a few clinics that have them. At least, you know, like I said, like at least one in the middle and one on both sides. Um, but yeah. Anyway, now Amberlynn Reed. This is a very <laughs> unflattering screenshot from a video. I was getting lazy with the pictures at the end there. So she is the original girl, and the creator that resulted in this sort of reaction channel community. Mm. Amberlynn is often described being known as eras based on the people that she's dated because she's been single for about nine to ten months cumulatively in the last 17 years oh wow she had a really bad time in foster care was in and out she lived with her mom with her grandma when she was 18 they kicked her out and then she ended up moving in with her girlfriend casey sorry hold on partner casey who transitioned after the fact so that's why i misspoke a little bit because it's they're all called girlfriends but casey's actually a partner a boyfriend what have you but um under a different name. Casey is the not dead name, by the way, if you were wondering. Anyway. Oh, so awesome. I don't even, cool. I genuinely don't remember what Casey's other name. I forget like 90% of the time. I think I know what it is, but I don't even know. Anyway, Amber was in foster care, addiction, stuff like that. She said like one of her first binges was like a whole box of Girl Scout cookies in a group home or something. And then you've got the partners, which are the heiress, but she's also allegedly abused almost all of them that we know, if not all of them. Specifically, the worst being Casey Beck, formerly known as Becky, and Destiny. Mm. Casey was when Amber was 18 and Casey was 16. That's one of the really serious ones. I interviewed Mr. Snowflake about that one and everything. Mm. Uh, so and, and like Mr. Snowflake's like interviewed Casey as well. And then Beck is the most iconic one, I think, because like Amberlynn's peak in 2019, 2020 that I was talking about was dating Beck at the time. And then mm-hmm. Destiny is kind of iconic also because Destiny's kind of like the one that got away. Like Amber Lynn, like simped for Destiny so long. There's a really iconic live the stream. The one that got away. Damn. Yeah. Destiny's the one that got away. Like everyone says that. Uh, Amber Lynn, drunk, B Day live. This is what she did coping that Destiny left her. This is from a reaction channel. It's it's just her drinking a whole bottle of wine on live stream uh, uh, on Valentine's Day. <laughs> that's kind of relatable, though. Destiny broke up with her uh, in Jan- like late January of that year. This is also after Amberlynn got Destiny like so many gifts that it filled the whole floor of their apartment living room. And then Destiny dumped her anyway, and it was kind of based. Anyway, so <laughs> Amberlynn... <laughs> Has trolled a lot and has a lot of really iconic mukbangs. Mm-hmm. One of them that you might recognize because of TikTok. So I have C Panera mukbang and it is hyperlinked and that link works. So this is the. Mm-hmm. Hold on. I'm getting there. Hold on. I freaking miss those chips. Chili. We used to have a Panera it's near my so work good. and it closed and during COVID I and I freaking miss those kettle sandwich. chips. Literally just has veggies. They gave me two chips, although I asked for an apple. But so that's okay. now a famous TikTok I audio. More- I asked for, uh, t- um, was it? Hold on, I got two chips, but I asked for an apple. They gave me two chips, although I but asked okay. for an apple, <laughs> that's like- but that's okay. 
and I have no. She got this is one of her. Look at the 350k views. This is video is good for, the, for our girl here. Damn. For an apple, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm in the trenches, okay? I told you, special interest slideshow. And I was being serious. <laughs> anyway, so Amber. And then has gained 200 LBs. Spelled I like that. Because that's LBs. how she says it. Yeah, it's because she says pounds like LBs. <laughs> so it, people spell it like this. Since <laughs> weight loss journey began in 2013. So that's what pe that's people's typical like point of entry. Is like the intrigue on how does someone like... Because it's one thing you gain, you gain like even 50 pounds. But mm, she went yeah. from like... She went from like 360 or 350 something to 570 in that time. So it's like, yeah, especially yeah. because respectfully, it's pretty hard to main like what gaining weight can be really easy when you're like lighter. But once you're getting like 500 pounds, the maintenance calories for that is very, very high. Right. So then people are just intrigued on the general. Like, how do you keep that? Because also she lies a lot. She'll be like, oh, what I eat in a day. She eats like two eggs and some turkey bacon and a piece of toast. And then like. Uh, bell peppers and cream cheese and turkey slices and then like chili soup in a day but it's like girl respectfully you are that's no that's not happening like that's not what that so that's that, that's like where the point of entry is but then there's people like me they get way too into the lore and the intrigue around the other stuff like my videos are never ever about her diets her yeah, weight loss I was gonna say, I feel like literally... this is the first time I've heard you talk about like yeah. her habits or anything because you're always talking no. about all the crazy stuff she gets up to yeah i was gonna say like i just talk about because she's a horrible like morally corrupt human being and so but you get on the point of entry of just intrigue on like how does someone gain 200 pounds trying yeah. to lose weight and then but then that all goes out the window after you're like oh abuse multiple partners like and allegedly animals plus xyz fights with people messy as hell like everything else next the queen ready set bees now Chantel has changed her channel name a lot of times hence okay. why there's a paragraph of names at the bottom of this slide and oh i'm actually God. missing the newest one and i'll add that in after miriam and everyday miriam Chantel miriam Marie, Chantel show every day Chantel Marie, Chantel Show, Foodie Beauty, Foodie Poopy. That's what people have been calling her since the poop gate, which I'll get into that later. Chantel, <laughs> period. Beezer Incorporated, Chantel and Salah. That's the couple's channel. Big Beautiful Me, The Beezer Show. That was the old name of the couple's channel. Foodie Cutie, Chantel Al Rafe, which she thought that you take people's last names when you marry them in Islam, which you don't. Blobby Bobby, which is what Zachary Michael calls her, and Chantopolis. And Everyday <laughs> Miriam, and also Miriam. Chantopolis sounds... That one's oh. epic, I think, TBA. That one's pretty funny. You know, that sounds like an Like Mikopolis? That sounds iconic. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think I could do that. Like, I think I, I would want that. Now, now, you see, she has two slides because there's too much to, <laughs> to put it. Booty Beauty. Messiest girl. Like, I don't know where to start even. Is what I wrote verbatim because I was like genuinely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Fetishizes men from minority groups, seemingly most often the Middle East. Right. So she had a guy named Bibi she was dating who was from Senegal. I want to mm -hmm. say I could be wrong. People will correct me in the description. He's from somewhere like that anyway. Also, because I haven't heard from him. We haven't heard about him in like four years. So that's why I don't remember. Anyway, then she dated Natter from Egypt. And then now she's with Salah. Well, so there was a Turkish guy, too, in the middle. Okay. Who's married. And then you've got Salah, who's from Kuwait. Uh, I was, but is a uh, refugee from Syria. Who lives in Kuwait. Also got popular on mukbangs, because Emerlin's biggest videos were mukbangs, hence the Panera Bread, Two Chips and an Apple. So <laughs> she's Graveyard True Crime Mukbang. I'm going to have to explain that one. <laughs> but also but also did what's called Time Warp 1950s and other Time Warp mukbangs. Now, since making this slideshow, the Time Warp mukbangs used to still be up on her channel. They're not anymore as of like as of like 3 days ago cuz this is how wild she's on the train on. Like she's constantly like privating stuff or removing stuff and doing all this nonsense. Mm -hmm. She's removed 30 million views of videos easily. She removed Whoa. six million like last week. 
Oh, you can see it like on our social blade. Like there's like a bunch of like wild looking like the charts look nuts. Anyway, um, I have very, very few negative view days, which is what happens when you delete popular videos. I think I privated my super mega video, which was only at 14,000. So I think like that day I had like negative 6K or something. I think it's like I've never have like negative 6 million or anything like that. So Cheese Graveyard True Crime Mukbang. This had <laughs> articles written about it because really? Chantel was talking about this super wild true crime case. And the only video I can find is this reaction from this person in the YouTube underground, also known as Yaba. So what Chantel did was she bought a bunch of cheese from Farm Boy and then put on this wig and, and was talking about this like serial uh, killer case while shoving <laughs> fistfuls of cheese. Is that a Frankenstein nutcracker? Yeah. From winners, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but she's got wine from what I could presume is like the wine rack. Anyway, my sleep paralysis demon be like, <laughs> "You're showing us, dude. You're you yeah, was kind of known as a hick. Like this is a good you girl. Let our girl talk, damn. It actually works. Let me have another bite. But yeah, what so she's. Works? This is what this is the mukbang. Yeah. Yep. And then it sees also like a bunch of just weird silence. It's actually really good. <laughs> like she doesn't edit properly, so there's always like a so cool. much dead air in her videos. That was your like life. even if I just bring up like current Fobby Bobby. Oh, what's her mm -hmm. name? I have to look it up. It's a stupid new name. Everyday Miriam. <laughs> hey guys, hey. I know your girlfriend. We're like skipping. Too bad. <laughs> All right. I wanted to something was on my mind when I think of sushi. It reminds me of the sushi place I used to go to with a really close friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's just ripping ass mean sushi. Like just <laughs> Pretty this awesome. is this is the content. Anyway, that's why most reactors watch her at like two times speed or one point five minimum usually, because yeah, it's just like that. eighty percent dead silence. Um. Also, and new farts. theory. See her sub count. Mm -hmm. Ninety nine point two, but only nine k views, three point seven k, fifteen seven point four. Wow. We do like they're not cracking ten, so I get way better views than her. Right now. Mm -hmm. Like this, because we haven't done this in a while, I expect this to get like foodie beauty views. But the thing <laughs> is, foodie beauty Probably. has 99.2 and it's been going up by like 100 a day every day at like the same time. Hmm. Uh. <laughs> so people are, are sussed out that she's botting subs. She... <laughs> She's not even being slick about it. She's so not even slick. Yeah. And the thing is, is which I don't know if she's realizing, is that when YouTube, like, when you, you have to, requ you don't get the play button automatically. You have to actually, like, request it. Ugh. And then on top of that, you have to get audited. So what they're going to do, so let's say if I ever hit, like, 100K, right, I, I request the plaque. What they'll do Ugh. is they'll check, like, my whole channel history, have my subs been organic? Like, has I ha have I had like substantial sub growth in conjunction with a substantial video, for example, right? Like that's something that they'll check. So let's mm. say like Mama Max video has been like pretty decent with like sub gain, for example. It's like they'll check something like that where if it makes sense, it's like, oh, so let's say like my Mama Max video, I've gained 63 subs on 25,000 views. So that wow. feels or that feel that's actually like that that feels like kind of low even right but they'll check like yeah. based on whatever right i think it's because this video a lot of it is a lot of it is like my current subscriber base watching it as opposed to like new people watching it mm. i can check all that later but i don't feel like it anyway so then we've got the time warp 1950s mukbang you which know what i I'm ended saying? this link that we were talking early, earlier because they did not <laughs> it has also been removed but Foodie Beauty dressed like Pop Fiction. 
and has like an old fashioned cheeseburger and a milkshake. That's pretty cunt. A cooking video. It is incredibly slay and very, but I oh, wish she wasn't horrible. But it's pretty it's, it's yeah. Very yeah. Damn. But the oh, link, the like, look at the look at the wig. The wig's so badly, and just doing the mukbang. Look how sweaty she is, and it's sticking. <laughs> The girl, bangs we got are also giving turf. To be honest, like we need to give her a lace front. I think we got to get like a lace front in there. Well, now she wears any jobs. Like it doesn't matter. But anyway, so this is a very iconic moment in um, history. This is also a very iconic Zachary Michael background, the old brick wall with the Furby with the long legs. Well, this is played by Uma Thurman, and Vince Vegas played by John Travolta. And Tarantino seemed to have like some kind of weird obsession with Uma. I think he I think I read that he loved her feet. He has like a foot fetish. Okay, well we're No, not she does not work. wipe that mayonnaise off, by the way. <laughs> I'm thinking about it too. Anyway. <laughs> so also known for eras of people that she dates because she's entirely defined by the guy that she's with at any given time. So there was BB, which was the guy that I said, I think is from Senegal or something who immigrated here. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a single arc after BB, which was her trying to date a couple people. She said she hooked okay. up with a guy in a car. Everybody's like, no, you didn't. And then Wait, how did they know? Because the foodie beauty lies about everything. That's why. Because pe oh. and, and because she's like a lol cow, which we'll get to at the very end, people figured out like where she, how long she was there for based on like when the sun moves or something. Anyway, my boyfriend's geo guessed where she's at a few times. Because uh like, well, it's also because like Cornwall's not that far. And like, we've been there before, you know? Mm. So someone figured out she was going to the weed store because they saw the parking lot. So she had, Star she's boycotting Starbucks, but she got a bunch of gift cards for Christmas from her family. So she was just going to like spend them before she could left or whatever. And then that parking lot, which is funny because I practiced parking there like last year, like this time last year. <laughs> um, that parking lot has a one plant in it. And also a shopper's drug mart. Because Foodie went to Starbucks and she went to shoppers. And then and then someone was like, I feel like I know where that is. And then they found it. And then and then they went to the weed store and they go, Did this lady show up? And they're like, Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, Yeah, she bought an ounce. She's bought Damn. and they're like and they're like she's got two ounces since she came back and she only been back for like three weeks. Like that girl was like pounding ounces. Like it's crazy. Damn. Because like for the non smokers out there, a lot of people that I know that are like frequent smokers or like daily smokers go through like an ounce a month. Maybe two yeah, ounces like a an month. Ounce is a lot to go through. Like I'm not that good at weed, man. <laughs> uh, I'm not like I don't really like, you know, go into that enough to like just like, to like look at something and know. But like, like I said, from what I heard from like most people I know that are like frequent smokers, it's it's one to two ounces a month. She did yeah. two to three ounces in three weeks. Plus edibles, <laughs> plus a vape pen, which is crazy. <laughs> She's just so, fucking ripped all the time. Slamming the Benjamin. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Not to mention she was driving the whole time, but that's like neither here nor there. Well, we get like uh, that's a whole other part of her lore anyway. <laughs> and then we've got Natter, who is a dealer who also allegedly tried to kill one of his ex-girlfriends with a knife. Uh, oh my god, what? Allegedly sexually assaulted somebody, is going to court for that now. Jeez. Also alleged abuse his videos, abuse that he lives with now in Leshin, which is on the west island of Montreal. On a on a channel called Sam's Bar Lounge or something. I didn't want to include that because this is silly T E Ha, so that's why I thought none of that's in here. Mm -hmm. And then he yeah, he's just horrible and decrepit and disgusting and awful and bigoted, racist and disgust and just everything bad. He is that thing. And then I just have weird dating arc with married guy. That was the Turkish guy. And then Sala. Uh, okay. many serious controversies from racism, i.e. the Cuba rage. So I cannot what does that mean. I'm getting what there. Cuba rage? Okay. I cannot play any part of the Cuba Rage for you here today, or I will get instantly age restricted and maybe a strike also. Oh my Chantel, god! Chantel, in early 2022, went on vacation to Cuba, where she got really drunk because they're not allowed weed in Cuba. Yeah, and and she was doing edibles, what she called wheelchairs. 
So like sometimes from like stores that are not necessarily government allowed in Canada, for those of you who don't know, because again, we're doing the general audience here. I've seen people buy thousand milligram chocolate bars. Yeah. Edibles. Government edibles are 10 milligrams at most. There is one type of edible you can buy that's like 10 each and there's 10 in the bag because they're like mints or something. Someone had them at a party, I think, once or something. Anyway, so those mint thingies are the most you can possibly, I think the most you can possibly get. Because what I've heard is 10 yeah, is the, is the, is the over 10. Is, yeah, 10 is the like, so yeah. th- imagine a thousand, okay? Most Jesus people Christ. don't get anything from 10. Most people, it's like 20 is like good, you know? Uh, and then like more frequent people that I could, it's like 100, it's like 50 to 100, usually something like that. But a thousand in a day is insane. Like in a thousand a day is like, you can't even like. That would kill Willie Nelson. That would kill most people. That would kill me. If I slam a thousand <laughs> milligrams in a day, I'm in the hospital. Okay. Actually, I don't know. I shouldn't assume Willie's tolerance. He's been smoking longer than I've been alive. But I'm just thinking of the most, like the highest tolerance of the person I know. And like a thousand would knock them out for a long time, at least for like nine hours. Maybe not days, but nine hours. I don't know. I think everyone I know, a thousand milligrams, if it doesn't actually hospitalize them, would <laughs> they would be screwed up for like another full day after. Yeah, at least. Like at least, you know? Um, and she would slam those chocolate bars like on the daily almost. So so that's so then to also anyway, she went to Cuba, you can't have weed. So she was just pounded back drinks for the same kind of vibes or whatever. And then yeah. she went on this like drunken rampage that was super racist, saying that like Natter should get deported as an Egyptian and doesn't deserve to breathe Canadian air. Oh my god. And there was like a bunch of other stuff and a ton of like ableist slurs. It was live streamed. Oh my God. (laughs) And it was like three hours long. Oh yeah. And she was mad because Natter left her for that girl in the shin. And she admitted while drunk on that live stream that they had a threesome and she ate her cool. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) This is what I mean when I say this is so crazy. (laughs) This is crazy. Okay. Mocking school oh. <laughs> mocking school shootings. Pumped up dicks. I'm not laughing oh at I'm God. not I'm not laughing at the fact that, that I'm laughing Girl, at the sheer absurdity. Yeah. No, it's not I know it's like I, I genuinely like it's horrible. And and I'm it's just the fact that it exists is so mm-hmm. funny to me in the sense of just like how are you a- anyway. So when the shooting happened in Texas, Uvalde, Uvalde, right? Mm-hmm. The really bad one where the cops didn't do anything and there was like a bunch of kids. Remember that whole thing? Yeah. She got really, she had a wheelchair that was on live stream, <laughs> tried to essentially borderline essay her roommate. What? Like she like threw herself on him on live. It was like, let me fuck your name. It was like super messed up. Oh and my then God. he was sitting there like swaying like this, just like listening to pumped up kicks. And then she oh went on like a on like a rant about like American gun laws, very like Canadian nationalist type rant. Mm. I need to hurry up because you need to go. <laughs> um, the other ones are, are quicker, <laughs> I promise. And no, then, you're fine. and then we've got neglected her cats BBJ situation. Okay, I'm gonna explain to you later who FFG is. FFG <laughs> lives in Montreal. Okay, and mm. Chantal. When upon so she did a two month test run with the Kuwait guy to which mm-hmm. apparent they uh they got they got married after a week but we don't know anyway there's a lot of evidence that implies that they never actually got married but they just lied because you can't live with someone in Kuwait if you're not married per like the Sharia law or whatever and mm-hmm. she comes back and she's like okay well I'm moving away to um to Kuwait. And thus, I need to get rid of my cats, BBJ and Sam. BBJ is like 20 something years old. BBJ is old as sin. Okay. Chantel was trying to put BBJ down. Even though BBJ was like more or less fine. 
But Chantel's like, well, BBJ's like walking around weird and like he's like really like lethargic and whatever. It's because BBJ had mats everywhere. And when animals mm-hmm. get mats in their armpits, right, it's hard to do this thing, like the 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 walking motion, right? Mm-hmm. And then also her claws hadn't been clipped in so long, they were embedded into the foot pads. Oh, ouch. So she could she wasn't walking around because of her, you know, so FFG noticed that the cats were looking rough. So mm-hmm. she made a fake profile on Instagram named something flowers. Mm-hmm. Fakest name ever, by the way. It was like Amy Flowers or something like that. Like, <laughs> girl, come on. Like, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Anyway, and then essentially like scam Chantel into giving her the cat mm-hmm. by getting her brother, I think, to pick her up. Because Chantel knows what FFG looks like. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and then FFG took BBJ to the vet mm-hmm. and then told everyone what condition she was in. So Chantel oh says God. that it's for clout and everything. And FFG insists that it was like her being like charitable or, you know what I mean, like nice or what have you. Most people understand it lies somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. Where it's like, she fell for the cat because clearly, like, the cat looked like he was in bad shape or she was in bad shape. I can't remember what, anyway. And also, like, understanding that Chantel should be exposed. But also, one of her most popular videos is the BBG, BBJ video. Like, let's be real, right? Uh, constantly rages at reaction channels. Chantel, uh, Charlie Gold, and FFG went on a, a Char- Charlie Gold is Haitian. Okay. And uh, she called her Charlie Cole because her soul is dark. And then, amongst other things, has kept keeps calling FFG a goblin, even though she's Jewish. And that's been like the recent, yeah. like the recent, like tirade of like raging. Um, when people talk about like, yeah, no, that's. I mean, I feel like I shouldn't be surprised at these things after you told me about the Cuba rant. Yeah, Which I don't but it, that just sucks, you know, because like there's people crying wolf about. Oh, here's her. Here's literally the first community tab post because FFG also says stupid stuff like she calls uh, Chantel like Mary Ham. Because she's like fat. But uh. the thing is, is like this Mariam concept is a thing related to Islam or something. And obviously like pigs and pork are like haram as fuck so like it's just kind of out of taste you poor taste you know yeah but Chantel no. takes that and goes like I can call her whatever she wants and like to me a goblin is a is a cre- um, is they're it? it's a, uh, a mythical creature or something but it's like yeah yeah you know how they're like mythical creatures that are usually like you know super selfish debt collectors those no like goblins you know like, like you might want to think about that <laughs> yeah no exactly like that's the thing they are an anti-semitic trope like goblins were used to like a lot of um fairy tales were used to spread like anti-semitic bigotry in like europe throughout the middle ages you know like goblins themselves are an anti-semitic stereotype so that's like, she literally started posting her. books that feature goblins ew this award-winning children's author Writes books for kids about goblins. Should he be canceled? No. Why? Because he's writing about mythical creatures. So miss me with that anti-Semitic BS. A goblin is not People necessarily about Jews. Criticize uh, JK Rowling. And then she that. hits with, "I'm not. I'm only anti-Zionist, not anti-Semitic." I'm like, "You're really oh, gonna pull Palestine into this one, girl? Be so for real. Oh my girl. god." And it's <gasps> people like this who act in bad faith who are being bigots that, like, you know. Zionists get to go oh see like you know they're all they're all hateful they want like she perpetuates so harmful so many harmful things about Palestinians and this hurts the movement like I hate that especially like like around this time when you hear about the rise in like hate crimes towards Palestinians yeah like like there there have been yeah there have been but also like it feeds into the Jewish stuff right because there have been like on the island of Montreal in the Jewish community, someone shot at one of the schools. Yeah. Like there is like, a rise there is a rise in anti-Semitism as a result of this, but 
a lot of that is distracting. Like it's nuanced, right? As as most things are, yeah. and that's the issue with trying to talk to anybody about anything ever, because you know the nuances present themselves, right? Same thing is like, you know, there's nuances around like Israeli citizens and and settling and where the like and and, and like the Jewish struggle historically in context with the like mm-hmm. those who are or the Muslim struggle rather and moving around being displaced as well. And there's obviously like a ton of layers, right? But mm. she's picking and choosing the layers to be Semitic, which. Yeah. No, uh, that's. Yeah. Awful. And so when it says. What has happened? Oh. When it says bad partners poop gate, her man. This is the thing I told you was better than crisp. <laughs> Just a switch up. We went from her being an anti Semite. I like, know. Back to I know. So poop gate <laughs> is her man started messaging somebody who was like a channel mod for Chantel. Named oh, Kybella. And then Kybella started DMing him on a on a secret Instagram. And he's like, I want to sh on you. That's how that's how he said it too. Like I was actually a pretty good. <laughs> and then he was like saying that he wanted to like put his nuts on her cross necklace. Like crazy, like religious defiling stuff. There Ooh. was um a lot of really like weird degradation things and then i said on my stream and people got mad where i said like you need to unpack that humiliating women and degrading them and literally using them as human toilets is a fetish in the first place maybe yeah. we need to visit that we need to unpack that one a little bit i'm not yeah. a rad femme by any capacity but oh, sometimes they're sometimes behemoth- now. So- but sometimes they're like behemothly like anti-sex work arguments and stuff there is some merit to some parts of it and that i find is an example where it's like why is it culturally acceptable for female degradation but not and then there's like the dominatrix thing but men choose that Mm -hmm. women don't impose to the same way of like i want to be your dominatrix no it's i want a dominatrix or but I'm going to degrade you like that will happen, but not necessarily as much the other way around. This is something I learned about too. And like, I took a philosophy of sex course and that was something that was like discussed a lot. It's like, well, why are like, you need to unpack why these exist in the first place and why you like them. Mm -hmm. We usually talk about when you're talking about like Vosh too, but we're not getting into that today. Uh, No, But like, but like that concept of like, you should unpack why you feel these things about these certain different whatevers. So they start calling that poop gate. And Chantal leaving Canada in a rush resulted in her slamming back the, the cannabis. And that led to FFG finding that she bought the ounces. And then, <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> that was one of the best weeks in girl world. Like <laughs> I, 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 I cuddled up. Yeah. I cuddled up some Swift with some adult libations <laughs> and just, and just watch the streams. On my TV, I bought that day. I'm literally getting notifications of Alex Shook lives of sniping her stream, and I'm in Costco with my man. Like, we need to hurry up. Like, like we, need to hurry up. Were, we were FaceTiming too. You were like, "Hold on, Foodie Beauty just posted. I gotta go. Hang up." Yeah, like, so, <laughs> and then too many failed diets to count. That's how people got into her because she had the similar thing as Amberlynn Reed, mm-hmm. but was like raunchier and Canadian. So people thought that was kind of funny. And she used to do like TMI story time. She'd fart while eating. So people thought it was, it was like a bit of a different, a bit of like a different vibe. Like Hootie Beauty was more like upfront about stuff. Well, I always talk about how I'm so anxious to make YouTube videos. And like, I could literally be posting videos of me having a mukbang and farting and get like 90K subscribers. Like, what am I doing? Like, yeah, it's like she, because Amber Lynn tries to make an image of herself as this, like, well put together, clean, neat, you know, whatever. Like, Amber Lynn's really focused on, like, image. <laughs> <laughs> now she's, now Chantel's trying to, since, like, the Salah stuff, it's not the same. Anyway, now, yeah. Booty was involved with the most iconic thing to ever happen on the internet. And I'm so serious. <laughs> Unironically, my Roman Empire, I think about this daily, probably. But it's called the CPAP rescue, also non politically correctly known as the Crack Olympics, which is when Natter kept her CPAP machine in his house, but which Chantal <laughs> left it there on purpose 
so that she could go back for it and pretend and talk to him. But then he's like, I'm not giving it back to you. And then he proceeded to take that. And she but then she goes, I'm getting it no matter what. She drives over. And then he <laughs> and then he won't give it to her. So she calls the cops on him. She's parked down the street. The cops show up to question her. And then her stream cuts. His stream's still on. The broad that or the bro the lady that he's with from <laughs> the lady that he's with from the Shin, who's in Gatno at this point for now, is too boomer to understand that she needs to um. mute the uh the audio. So you hear the Gatno police talking to him. Uh, and I actually have a section of my first video ever on Foodie Beauty that includes her stream with the Gatno police. And then I'm translating it when they speak French. So, right? Get a piece of paper. Get a piece of paper for the case number. So I actually translated the Gatno police live. For one of my videos. This is like a long time ago. Because look at my room. Oh my god. The Waterloo apartment. Anyway, so this is my first video on Flobby Bobby for We Will Be Chantel Marie Chantel show from February 4th, 2022. So just over two years ago. Damn. Yep, yep. Me citing Young Dumb Honey Bun. Oh god. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. Why isn't anyway. she a part of Girl World? Um, what are you talking about? We haven't gotten there oh. yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is embedded into the slides, by the way. Um, I also said she would also do substances and drive crying emoji. <laughs> this is Alex is shook reacting Hi to guys, the Alex, live welcome back to stream. Or okay. she's just driving and raging. While she's going to get her seat, this also. Have fun with the ST. I remember I was like Hi folding guys, laundry here, back to in my room in Waterloo, and I was freaking out. Like I was like, <laughs> this is so. But I had to like, I would, usually I, wa I would watch stuff in my living room. I was watching this in my room by myself. Like I was too ashamed. <laughs> anyway, CPAP rescue was absolutely incredible. <laughs> Like the funniest thing I've ever seen, probably. Like, cause it ju it was literally them, like streaming. Oops, it was literally them streaming at Hi each guys, other. Hi guys, Alex here. Welcome back like, to we can see. Shook Hold After on. Dark. I'm doing a very special impact. I, was, I saw Imagine it. Imagine what is going on in there. You can see Alex cutting back and forth. Here we go. The ah, oh, I hate that I can't do it like that. You can see Alex cutting back and forth I'm between the streams. Here we go. Is that crystal clear? That's to you? Natter. Or a little foggy. Crystal. But he's still. You home and talk but you can hear on Natter's stream, they're, they're watching Foodie Beauty stream. Oh my God. Anyways, incredible. <laughs> Next. Unintelligible moaning, hungry fat chick. That's this person. That's the other one that you didn't know. Muckbanger yeah. and S Worker. Uh, she's made fetish content related to food. Oldest okay. active girl. She's like 48. Besties with Nick Cotto Avocado. Unproblematic queen, especially in, co in comparison to the other girls. She okay. does. I did find out today, however, that she had children that she then gave up to for adoption to her mother-in-law of her now ex-husband. So there was some stuff happening earlier in her life, but we don't really really like she doesn't talk about her kids like ever. So that that's wow. why I only found out about that today because she mentioned it in a reason. Like it's very like so still not really messy in regards to like internet stuff. Like that's personal stuff. That's not really like, you know, you don't put it online. You're not making it an online thing. So I'm not really going to like exactly. do it too much. Actually successful weight loss on carnivore, but had to give up because of how AdSense was so low because people just wanted to see her eat food and moan. Oh, it's unfortunate. That's really yeah. unfortunate. Her stuff's kind of sad. That's why it's very short, but she is part of girl world. Then we've got, yeah. it's just water weight. Nick Cotto, oh, Cotto. Cool. The most of popular about Nick. Yeah. Most popular creator of the bunch. Mm -hmm. And then known for the amounts of food he eats while also fighting with husband four question marks named Orland. This hyperlinks to Orland's channel. Only really covered or reacted to in Girl World when he's being particularly messy, losing weight, or making fun of Amberlyn Reed, which he mm -hmm. does. 
There's a whole compilation on it. Amber, we did it. We both got diabetes on camera. We should have or the fart. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> also, anyway. like, kind of craving Wingstop. Whenever I see that green paper, I'm like, mm. I haven't had Wingstop before. They don't have it here, unfortunately. Oh, uh, we'll try it eventually. I do say I I or I will Uber eat Hooters wings. Oh uh, yeah. Because they're also like the cheapest and they're genuinely really good with the and I've been making when I make my own wings. I now make Daytona beach sauce. Because it's Buffalo. It's a Hooter sauce. It's it's Buffalo barbecue. And a little bit of honey. It's really, really good. And a tiny splash of apple cider vinegar. It's delicious. Anyway. Yum. Damn, I want wings. I know me too. Anyway, <laughs> covered more by bigger essay channels than reaction channels. So, like, mm -hmm. the right opinion has like a four and a half hour long doc on him. People typically talk of, more like my neck of the woods talk about Nick more than like the reaction channels. People lump him into girl world also. We're probably going to need a film later, girl, by the way. I don't know what is happening. Like, this is. <laughs> Honestly, that's fine. That's fine. We can film later. Milo's, Milo's gonna be sitting next to you over. while I'm just like running my mouth like it. That's totally fine. He can he, he can sit and listen to Girl World and Robots. That's just that's I just think what it I'll is. I'll be able to finish, but we might need to get back with yours. But what I'll do is in the meantime, mm -hmm. I'll start editing my piece down so that it will oh. have it will be quick enough. Because sometimes when my students are typing, I don't want to talk and I get distracted, so I edit my video on the other monitor while they're writing stuff. <laughs> um Da, da, da. keeps private life really private which is why the reaction channels don't talk about him that much because the, the, the stuff that they're really interested in is like the more private stuff like the like the poop gate and the and the CPAP rescue you know what I mean like those more like <laughs> reality show plot line type stuff not just like being a character on camera because Nick Akato is clearly a character so it loses that 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 sort of like because like Chantel like that's Chantel like that's like real yeah. <laughs> and that's why it's so like nuts it's like Chantel is is really Chantel you know like Chantel lies all the time but the lies are like the normal it's, it's like trying to make her look like a normal person not like you know what I mean no. meanwhile Nick Akato's like exaggerating stuff Chantel is lying to tone stuff back and that's the difference between <clears throat> the sorts of interesting characters Ugh. now we move on to the reaction channels the girl's biggest ops is what I've called this section. The girl's Here we go. Space. So I have the reaction channels, people that are low key, almost as messy as the girls themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got Charlie Gold, active. Alex is shook, active. French fried girl. That's the one of interest. We're going to get into her. Young, dumb, okay. honey bun. Inactive since 2023. Mm -hmm. We're almost at a year. I think I'm going to have a stream of like watching some old YDHB videos I have in my Google Drive. When it's like the <laughs> one here, she's she's fallen off anniversary because I feel like that'd be fun. She's Michael, fallen off anniversary. <laughs> yeah, Michael B. Petty inactive since 2020. Zachary Michael, who's still active, and Karina Kaboom, active but no longer does face cam, which we'll get into oh, that. Oh, I remember Karina Kaboom. She was a, a a drama channel first. Yeah, like a like a Jaclyn Hill whatever kind of vibe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she Michael also B. had beef with um uh without a crystal ball. Oh, probably definitely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Michael B. Petty, considered the father of the modern reaction channel community. He oh. was kind of one of the first ones to be really popular. Peaked at around 80,000 subs, I think, something like that. Uh one of the original reactors all the way back to 2018. Okay. Most people came in 2019-2020. Alex is shook will describe them as like waves. So like wave one was like Michael B. Petty, Zachary Michael, Karina Kaboom. Wave two was like Alex, Young Dumb Honey Bun, Charlie Gold, uh, French Fry Girl. I think French Fry Girl too, maybe. And then the newer wave being some of the newer ones. There's like a guy named Yo Mama or something that does it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Arguably me, even to a certain degree. I'm not a reaction channel by any means, but like, People that make content about them. Mr. Snowflake, the the documentary guy, like he's considered like new wave, whatever. Um, 
So he did AmberCon with other reaction channels. Mm -hmm. That's like a really famous thing. They all like got together and like kikied or whatever. Um, st oh, stopped uploading in 2020. Very active in Girl World Twitter. And Ugh. also seems to be universally beloved. I am not crazy about his videos, let TBH. Like, I think they're just kind of like, it's just him constantly being like, you should have done this. You should have done this. It's, sad, it's, sad, it's, sad. it's like, I guess at the time, like someone pointing out like how her inaccuracies are and things like that were not like that common. Right? This was like mm -hmm. the first person to like, so I can understand. It's just to me, it didn't age the best. But I think mm -hmm. it's also because I just look for different forms of content too. Cause there's a lot of reaction channels I won't watch too. Cause I think they're kind of annoying. Like I can I can understand that it could just very well be like a difference in like the content drive. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a recent tweet. It reads, raise your hand if you allegedly burn yourself with a pipe while spending the night on your hands and knees, worshiping the feet of an attempt. Uh and then she's got the lip burn from the pipe. Oh my god. Anyways. Oh my gosh. Charlie Gold. Uh, was once the most popular she's reactor so of them. Hmm? Like, can I just say, like, she's very pretty. Oh, yes, she is. Yes. Yeah. Very, very slay makeup looks. Yeah. Uh, was once the most popular reactor in 2019, 2020, was prime target of Chantel at the time of her peak as well. Began mm -hmm. reacting while also on a weight loss journey, but has since given up on sharing any of that stuff publicly. Mm hmm. She became popular because channels like Obese to Beast like featured her because she made a video called like the truth about obesity or something because she got oh. up to like 400 pounds and then became housebound and like almost died. Oh, so 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 that's where she got really popular. But then she became anyway, it was like a whole spiral and then known for being really, really mean and has invented oh. terms like pig mad in, re in regards to Chantel, which I'll still watch Charlie stream sometimes if it's just because like a lot of people don't want to talk about Chantel anymore because I think she's boring. And if like I want I'm interested, I won't. But I refuse to watch Chantel's content. So it's also just like boring. <laughs> like mm -hmm. uh, challenge Amberlyn Reed to a weight loss channel channel challenge. But that amounts to nothing. Surprisingly, this was actually this was the first reaction channel that I watched. This kind of got me into the whole like because again, I, like right as her peak was happening, that was when I started like having interest in it. Ooh. Alex is shook, a queen in my not so humble opinion. Okay, <laughs> fave reactor. I'm watching uh, for like at least two years. I've been in the trenches on this one. Also, Amberlyn Reed's favorite reaction channel. Really, and she's been in his chat and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> as long as he doesn't ask if she might be bisexual, because <laughs> Amberlyn had Amberlyn's lesbian. I was and like, say, isn't she a lesbian? Is like camp lesbian level, like loves being a lesbian. But sometimes she says stuff like that she has an interest in men. Like it will kind of like she'll she'll mention things that kind of imply that or directly say that. So he's like, well, she could just like, try to accept that she's bisexual. Like he's, in, but not in like a hateful way, right? Like a, you know, there might be biphobia in the lesbian community way. You know what I mean? That like you're too no, scared to admit it. Biphobia in the know? lesbian community is so real. Um. Yeah, the, like the Twitter discourse I haven't seen the last few weeks. Not fun, but yeah. Okay, so... So, like, he's not being, like, hateful. He's like, just, girl, just, like, it's it's fine. Like, it's fine to be Because you can with a preference for women, just like how yeah, it's fine she's women who have a preference for men. Because there's been times where she's expressed that she might have interest in men, and that's that's all he was kind of, like, talking about, you know? Mm hmm Because uh, she's also, like, hugely into, like, masks. Like all Same. the girlfriends have been have been have been masked, you know, and I'm by no means, by no means at all, am I saying that that means you're interested in men secretly? Not at all. But I'm no, saying totally. like, if that plus the interest in men and plus like the all the stuff. Anyway, he will incorporate his personality and life stories in streams and stuff. Talks about like sobriety. His dad passed away when he was really young, and that kind of led to like drug abuse problems down the line with some mental health stuff. He talks about like that whole kind of like part of his life. Ooh. Also camp as hell. <laughs> he dressed as Amber Lynn's ex-girlfriend destiny. Cause they did a 21st birthday photo shoot for destiny in Kentucky, in like Kentucky or something or Florida. I can't remember where they lived at the time and it was really trashy. So he remade it for Halloween. How old is Amber Lynn, by the way? Like is she in her late 33 20? right now? 33. Now. Okay. This is Alex's recreation. 
And this is the is this is destiny. <laughs> so he even did the like This is pretty camp. This is pretty camp. <laughs> I would say so too. The um, fucking yeah. pedos and the, the I need to bookmark this because I've looked for this. I've had to look for this more than once for some reason. And I'm I'm just bookmarked it now because I'm like this I'm tired be of having a great wallpaper. Like the lighting and everything. I know in the ways this pictures look way nicer than that. <laughs> Like, like, you have like a really nice lens flare. Yeah, Yeah. there's like a really artistic lens flare. Like, what are you? Yeah, like the lighting is really nice. Like, also with this wig, like he kind of is giving like Phil Lester, like, like, you know, yeah, the face. I was like in his chat for that live stream when he was dressed as Destiny, and I was like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Like, I was on it. Like, (laughs) anyway. Uh, host girl world news show format called girl talk okay and like i'll do the intros he has a really iconic intro kind of like i had before like the squishmallow guy was a zionist i was he, <laughs> he'll be like you know welcome back to girl talk today we're talking about it's like all of the mess and all of the drama like he has like a, like a lines you know which i love i think it's cute mm-hmm. and then weekly shook after dark live streams that i am a moderator oh. of those live streams that's how in the trenches i am Next, Shook after French dark. fried girl. Almost exclusively, if not exclusively, streams. And does so every time Chantel breathes. <laughs> Chantel did a plus-size fashion show in Montreal, and FFG showed up. And oh, took a picture with Chantel. Yeah, this I took a FFG. picture with Chantel. Yeah. So oh. FFG doesn't face camp very often. Chantel says it's because she's ugly, too. Which, like, I don't necessarily co I just think it's kind of funny. <laughs> Very controversial because she cow tips. So that's a term coined by Kiwi Farms and, like, those types of whatever lol cow things. Where it just means, like, like, antagonizing lol cows? Yeah, it means, like, taking stuff into real life. Oh. Such as the BBJ thing, talking to the weed store people, stuff like that. Yeah. The fashion yeah, show would be cow tipping also. And then... Mm-hmm. Cons- some consider FFG a lol cow as well, and I think she has a Kiwi Farms thread, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. Um, from Montreal, Escalis. Once in a while, when nobody else talks about something, and only FFG does, I'll play the stream in the background. And I do appreciate the random Tabarnax thrown in, because, like, real recognize real on that one, for real. Anyway. <laughs> Get so many super chats that the first 30 minutes of every stream is just her reading them. Oh. Like she is a dead, and I said little jelly TBH, anyways. Little jelly. <laughs> well, because like every stream I do gets demonetized, and then like 70% of them get back to green, but most of them don't. So, <laughs> so or not most, a lot of them don't. So I kind of just like don't get money from them, which I don't like. I don't stream for money. I do the videos instead, right? But mm-hmm. like she's got like a dedicated audience like giving her coin like all the time Damn. Right? she gets like half of my rent in super chats per stream almost probably jesus she has a similar sub count to me but then her lives will have like 2.4k viewers at once which Ooh. is incredible numbers because my peak concurrent viewers for a premiere has been 600 or 700 Ooh. so my peak Live viewers is set, has been 700. My actual streams average between 140 and 210. Mm-hmm. Ish. So, uh, there is no one on earth that Foodie Beauty hates more than this woman. It's not a contest. Like, mm. if she could, like, literally, like, fill FFG with helium until she popped, like, she'd do it. You uh- know? <laughs> Young dumb honey bun, the content goat, in my opinion, <laughs> started because she went really off the rails at the end. <laughs> started as a compilation channel, which means that she just like clipped Amberlynn videos following a theme. Yeah, her biggest one was like Amberlynn Reed pronouncing words wrong for eight minutes straight or something like that. <laughs> Controversial from day one because people claim that she would take chunks of other compilation videos as filler into her compilation videos as opposed to like clipping the content raw, which like that's kind of content theft 
in that sort of end of YouTube because like the whole yeah. point is that you're taking the raw videos and clipping them, right? Yeah. Uh, that is like if I use compilations that I didn't clip, I will always like have on screen like it's this person's compilation. If I mm -hmm. didn't clip the pieces together, you know? Yeah. Started doing face cam content. She's really pretty. So that's also yeah. a big part to think of her blowing up is I would say she was arguably like the most conventionally attractive of them all, which like favored her a lot because a lot of the, uh, especially because a lot of the reactors are either gay men or they look like Chantel kind of, you know, like this is her Instagram. Young dumb honey bun. Yeah. Yeah, like she's trying no. to like go that like dark academia adjacent like you know indie girl. Well, she's speak. an educated woman. The, um, mm -hmm. L, okay, then she's an educated woman. L, we got to remember. Oh, I didn't she's know got that. Got two degrees or whatever. I have two videos on this girl. Anyway, I feel I did watch part of it, but I feel like I blocked that out of my memory. You know, I'm <laughs> not I'm not remembering every facet of her life. I know that she. Like, I want I want a picture of from when she was still like frequently reacting. Like I am kind of living for the aesthetic. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, like girl, people on the Reddit try to call her ugly. Like, let's be real for five minutes. Like, no, like be fucking. You know, real. be be realistic, please. Like. Mm. You know, well, I'm not necessarily like I was still following her at the time. 135 weeks been a long time. <laughs> yeah, but like that's like George not... Peterson level delusion. Like, oh, look at that woman with her tattoos. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like, that's Jordan Peterson level delusion. She does She's Photoshop there. her photos though, but still, like even just on video, it's like be serious. Like even this, yeah, like an no. unflattering screenshot, like still looking good, right? This is when she moved to London do her masters so she's living so now because the problem is she got a pass on her masters which people f have figured out in the uk means she got like a 50 oh i had a 3.98 gpa in my masters which is like a 99 yeah <laughs> so like that's not even a flex. What I'm saying is a lot of it was like a facade kind of thing, you know? Because, mm -hmm. like, she was always like, you know, I'm like a genius. She lied about going to med school, too. It was like a whole thing. Uh, oh, that part I remember. I remember you yeah. telling me she was going to med school. Uh, the, the, the very egotistical, flexed a lot, smells like coconut oil, immigrant woman who knows two languages. That was like a big thing that she would always say, like, I came to the UK with no language, but you spoke Polish, girl, for one. <laughs> like, you had a yeah. language. Let's say it wasn't no language. But also, like, you lived in Europe. I don't know. I don't want to question that necessarily, but I'm saying English isn't necessarily, like, out of your reach. You know, like, I feel like you really no. should. You're kind of treating it like you European. lived in you lived in fucking, like, deep Japan your whole life. And then you got put into English school at 15 years old. Like, that's how you kind of talk about it. It's like a bit hyperbolic. I said it feeds mm -hmm. into that facade thing that she's kind of into, you know? Ended YouTube career in 2023 with a slew of alt-right talking point videos. Mm, uh, this is the only thing that is still up on her channel. Okay. All that's left is why I'm leaving the left. Uh, of course. Video with... Wow. Um, Who's this guy? He's a he's a bigoted dumbass. Talk something. But I'm a trap. Let me. Ew, let me ew. Why is it only coming in my left headphone? Ew. Oh my god, she did a video with Buck Angel. That's his name. I said Chuck. Oh no, he's a so he's a trans man and he's a famous trans. Yeah, but I who are sort of like in this middle. Oh star. my god. Okay, sorry. Wait, I'm I'm not even. I'm gonna keep 100 with you. The fact that this is only coming out of one of my headphones, you want to commit die. Oh, that's fine. But he's actually so Buck Angel was responsible for getting ContraPoints canceled. ContraPoints' audience literally, literally canceled her because she had Buck Angel say one line in her opulence video, and they just dragged her on Twitter, called her a trans medicalist and everything. Because Buck Angel is a trans medicalist, but he wasn't as flagrant as he is now. And she and, he, and she says. She yeah. apologizes for like the video quality being bad and the and the audio quality being bad. 
if your audio was only coming out of one of my ears, I would like, there are audio softwares that can at least put it into stereo, like both ends stereo. And I love that someone said if Amberlyn audio was this bad, she would rant about how she needs a better job and that she's privileged for 20 straight minutes. <laughs> and that's like so real. And it's funny because there's an overlap because now like people are like talking about how the editing is, which I think is very funny. Anyway. So now we're on to Zachary Michael, I think. Right. Let me see. Make sure that actually like worked properly. Yeah. So now we have Zachary Michael, who is currently the most popular. But I think I might be wrong. I might have been wrong in that. Let me check something. Let me uh, verify my sourcing here. If I'm wrong, I'll fix it for before I post it for everybody else. No, he is the most popular by like 5K subs. Um, Current reaction channel King against fat phobia and weight shaming. His whole thing oh, is just okay. that they're that they're horrible people. Oh, the, he they pronouns, which I'm gonna try to use they them more, but he is okay. See already, they are okay with the uh, he him against fat phobia and weight shaming compared to sickly, slightly overweight lesbian streams on Twitch a lot about Dollar Tree hauls and other silly things. Mm -hmm. Big fan of reality TV. Also reacts to Thousand Pound Sisters and any spinoffs as long as they aren't boring. Amber yeah. Lynn's biggest op. Well, she hates she hates this person in, in, in like their entirety, really. Like she just is not a fan. Plays on a gay softball or volleyball team, I think. My chat says that it was softball and Fortnite <laughs> or something. Oh. But that they have played volleyball before or something like that. Talks to Tammy and Amy in the DMs on the regular. Mm -hmm. Finally, we have Karina Kaboom. This is what she looks like. Yeah. This was from a video, so no, I did not just dox this person. Be serious. There are videos of her with a face. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. First channel of this whole thing that started off as a drama commentary channel, I think was friends with Peter Mon at some point, based in parentheses. Has a fun accent. She calls Amber Amba because of her <laughs> accent. It's like a very like Long Island kind of like accent. Amba. Does not do face cam anymore. Has this whole bits about like Kermits and squirrels. It's okay. like very, this is very much just a silly hobby for her, which I can appreciate. Yeah. Loves Pokemon Go in the Lord's year of 2024. She'll have full Pokemon Go segments in videos. Finally, the Kiwi Farms pipeline. So you yeah. start with seeing a channel make a video essay on Amberlynn. Mm -hmm. Here's your entry into Girl World. Then you start watching reaction channels. Now you're in the YouTube trenches. Because now you've started watching reaction channels. Starts yes. picking up on references where they find missing content on the farms. People go, if you can't find this thing, look on the farms. <laughs> if you miss it on the T, that's the only place to find it half the time because they're deleting stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Then, realization that these figures are mainstream lol cows. And I said, it goes beyond the Chris Chan types, apparently. The lol cow thing is more extensive than that. Yeah. That is my slideshow. <laughs> Thank you. Yay! Bravo. Bravo. I Thank you. I appreciate your time. No. Okay. So we moved to Discord because the Zoom committed die. <laughs> so now I'm going to ask if Elle has any questions. And then that's that on my part, finally. And I dearly apologize for how long it was. I feel like we needed it to be that long, though. I feel like I have a much better understanding of everything now. Foodie Beauty is the lore master and god icon of our lives in Minecraft. Um, if I had Minecraft, my server would be called Shantopolis. New Patreon perk? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> Instead of like a Discord server, we have a Minecraft server. I'm surprised she hasn't opened a dispensary called Shantopolis. Like, I feel like that's... Yeah, she... Wa I mean, what she... Even? I think she ordered, I think, at the end of the Natter era, I think she ordered stuff to make weed oil with and things like that. <laughs> and I remember she... I think she expressed... It wasn't called Shantopolis or anything, but I think she expressed wanting to do, like, weed business stuff. Like I, that's, that's so genuinely funny. something that I vaguely remember, and I need and Imagine I you think that, it, like that good good and foodie beauty pulls up. You go to the you go to the plug. <laughs> that's your dealer. 
you go to the plug and it That's smells like plug. it smells like a moldy la crusade and you're like <laughs> it's shot <Chantel>. down <Ew. laughs> Yeah, oh, you don't know that either? <laughs> she you knew how she let a lac crusade. So get she had, I don't know if it was a lac crusade, but she had a um a Dutch oven that was pretty nice. Like I think it was the Costco one, like the one I have, anyway. And she um Yeah. She let it mold. And I'm talking like when you mold it, it opened and it was like blue puffs come out. Moldy. And she just threw it out. But like, it had passed it for like three out? months. Yeah, the whole thing. Well, it's like the pot I mean- was poison. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you I know cast iron. Point. Well, because cast iron is also a little bit porous, actually. Now Dutch mm-hmm. ovens have the um, enamel inside that doesn't really like it's like doesn't penetrate much. But still, I'm kind of like also like God. The experience of cleaning that, like, ooh, we. Oh hell no! But the thing is, is like the most I'll give up on is like a Tupperware. Like I don't really give up on like pans. You know, well, I feel like it I never haven't gets had. To that point. Yeah, I was say I've never gone to that yeah. point. I've had I've had a re- mm-hmm. I've had a really bad Tupperware because my fucking friend yeah. had it at her house, didn't wash it or anything, Ew. and just left it by the door for me, and I never saw it. So it was like, anyways, that girl dumb as rocks. Anyway, to yeah, we now will eight. transition because <laughs> I didn't mention that yet either. But we will now transition out of my PowerPoint. Because I am the one with all the recording things and such. I will share my screen and then Dale. Nope. And L will tell me that I, when I need to kind of just like turn the slide over. So we're discussing the necropolitics of robots. 2005. Uh, For those of you who haven't seen it, this will be major spoilers for a 19 year old movie. I don't care. Watch it. It's good. (laughs) I wanted to do chicken run. But um, John D. Duncan or uh, John Duncan has one already. Check out that video; it's good. It's really good. But this is similar in the same vein as Chicken Run, but robots, obviously, which I think is interesting given the given the tech climate currently, and given how much we're seeing with like you know manufactured obsolescence. But we'll get to that. <laughs> Do you want to right. define Next necropolitics slide. for the people, please? I'm people. That is at the end of the slideshow because I wanted to, like, I didn't, like, you were doing something so light and fluffy with Goral World. And I remember, like, when I literally called you in the middle of working on this and I was like, okay, Mika, like, I hope I cited everything okay. And you were like, girl, I didn't even do any citations for this. I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I like, said no, I, I like, wrote. Like, I literally have a line about a slightly overweight lesbian in, <laughs> which we now have come for full circle. Clearly, all right. Next slide. Oh, so, yeah, that's defined at the end. But I did want to talk about this guy who is a. He's I believe so. He's a film critic for the Chicago Sun Times um now but at the time he wrote this review he was doing a pod like a radio show with another film critic he was like there's no story here it just you know has kind of an interesting look it's sweet and it's just not funny at all the jokes are very tired you know yeah it had like you know campy jokes and stuff like that like there's one maybe not great like transphobic joke i talked to mika about where they think one character is a man and she's a woman, you know, ha ha ha, 2000s humor. But for the most part, I think, you know, he called it, he said it lacked originality and it, you know, was a very tired plot with the whole manufactured obsolescence. Like, that's kind of the core of what Robots is about. Um, But I think when when you assess that, like, their world like technology encompasses their world so much so that like, you know, repairs are like medicine for them. Like when they're getting like upgrades, that's effectively medicine because like technology extends beyond that to like, it's their, the bodies, right? It's not necessarily biotechnology because there isn't like, they'd be cyborgs if that was the case. Um, (laughs) And the distinction's important. Cyborg but is anyways, the most underrated like- Teen Titans character. I think so. I did love Star. I you know I love Starfire and Raven. 
Yeah, but that's I love those girls. The gay agenda girl. Like that's yeah. all that's the bisexual awakening. That's why it happened to you. And, you know, it worked. It worked. <sighs> it worked. It worked. But it did. It this did. This is kind of a bisexual looking slideshow too, because of the purple and pink meaning the dark blue on the bottom. I literally thought of that while I was making it because you told me you downloaded that um Among Us one. That template. Yeah. And I was like, Frank, it's so pretty too. But I didn't want to like I don't know. It already took me forever to finish the slideshow, as it did in like all of high school and all of my BA, but you know, ADHD for a reason. Anyways, I just wanted to call it this man and say he's wrong. And I'm about to prove him why. Like, <laughs> this man is wrong. And I'm about to prove him wrong. So, the movie opens oh, with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally. Literally. <laughs> the movie opens... Sorry, I'm just losing my mind already. Go on. No, I think, I think it's very important. I think this is very important. The movie opens with... And I think it's a... You know, he talks about how it's a tired joke. I think it's... I think it's camp. I think it's funny. How, you know, the guy's like, oh my god, my wife's, you know, we gotta go home. She's having a baby. And his wife's chilling with a box. Like, I think a society in which women do not have to go through pain to have a child. Idyllic to me. Idyllic. Okay? Maybe that's not relatable for a male film critic. But, you know what? Personally, based. We gotta anyway. hurry up, the baby arrived. Literally, he's running home. He goes home. And then I do think the joke where she's like, oh, now we get to make the baby. I'm like, this is kind of fun. This is kind of camp. Okay. They make Rodney the robot, right? He, they're obviously, like, very, like, shiny, newer models. I also want to highlight that, like, his dad is a dishwasher, right? He literally has, like, it built into him. Um, So they are, like, more of, like, lower middle class. But they still have a house. They still have, like, an idyllic life, right, in the suburbs, right? So... In this society, it's very clear out the gate that, like, not only are there humanoid robots, but there's, like, a class system of robots. Like, there are robots where that's, like, their entire function is their job, right? Like, you know, um, and then there are robots that are a bit more, like, human-like, right? And they're the ones, like, kind of, like, running society more so where then you've got, like, robots that are, like, buses and cars, right? And, and that's not to say that people who are like doing those jobs also don't contribute to society. But very clearly there's like a class system with all the robots, right? Not only that, but upgrades, like we talked about, anything of that nature, repairs, it's all basically healthcare, right? And, you know, as we see when Rodney, you know, grows up and moves to the city, um, you know, bad things happen to those who can't get repairs. Actually, hold on. There's another narrative happening here, um, you know, with, like, small town inventor in mind. You know, you've got, like, a lot of American dream themes running through this entire movie. Because Rodney comes from, like, a small later, sort of was the recession. Sorry. <laughs> no, <I'm> literally. Like... <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh, shit. Anyway, go on. No, that's okay. Next slide. Oh my god, I really hit with the recession. <laughs> okay. Literally. Recession. Okay, I need to, I keep Rodney to move is an around. inventor. Go on, go on. So like, me. it's a sad film that Rodney's an inventor and he loves Big Weld, right? Like this huge inventor. He's like, oh, anybody can achieve their dream, right? It's very American dream. It's very Americana. It's giving like, oh, like, you know, I can accomplish anything if I pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm this awesome innovator and I have this great mind and I want to share my inventions with the world. All he did was invent a, you know, robot that couldn't do its job. And it almost cost his dad's job. And so he was like, you know what? I'm going to roll to the big city. I can't, you know, I can't be in this small town anymore. So he goes. And I think this is where we really get to see, like, class reflected through robot bodies, right? Because when he initially goes, you know, his parents are, like, kind of hesitant to at first. They're like, oh, no. And then they're like, okay, begrudgingly support him. And when he moves to the city, there, you know, he comes across a lot more robots than he's used to back, like, in a small town. Similarly to, like, any small town character that goes to a, 
you know, a big urban city, right? So he meets Fender, who's voiced by Robin Williams. Total slay. Love it. And there's, you know, an interesting visual dichotomy, not only with, like, their colors, um, you know, Fender being, like, very bright red and, like, Rodney being, like, you know, more of a muted, shiny blue. But, you know, there's the idealist and the cynic, the new and the old, the urban and the suburban. Um, you know, Fender is quite literally, like, rusting and falling apart. And he's definitely more cynical. He's always calling Rodney kid in the film. And he's always like, oh, like, he's a hustler. Like, when he first meets Rodney, he's trying to, like, scam him and finesse him, right? So there's a lot that can be told through, like, bodies. Just, like, how we can in, like, our current society, right? Like, you know, when we talk about intersectionality and we talk about, like, other um, academic theories relating to... Uh, politics and like our physiology and our bodies and like how that relates to the world around us and how we uh you know interact with one another like you know we can already tell class from bodies in our current society but in the robot society it's almost like it's hyper exaggerated right like he's literally rusting at the seams right like we don't see, like we still see people like that in our society here definitely unfortunately but you know in an animated film it's you know very visceral it's very hyperbolic right like he's literally falling apart like at one point in the movie like his robot parts are falling apart um and i think this you know again like illustrates a lot of issues with like a class system in like a robot society which brings me to like the main conflict of the film next slide <laughs> this is really topical because i watched the <laughs> bionic pig robots video like two days ago so I weirdly enough remember way more about the film than I would have before. He did great analysis on it too. And like, that's the thing. I kept wanting him to do more class analysis. Cause like, okay. And this honestly, like this is literally Elon Musk. This guy doesn't invent shit. Like he literally has invented, like, what does he talk about inventing? Nothing. We literally meet him when he's doing a boardroom business meeting with all the other technocrat robots, right? Big Weld is nowhere to be found. Rodney is like literally looking for him. Can't find him anywhere. This guy literally scales the wall of a building. Like they really il illustrate just how much, like he really believes in the system. He's like, I just need to work hard. I just need to prove myself. They will take me seriously, you know? I just need them to see what I can do and show them who I am and they'll give me a chance, right? No, they don't care. They don't care. Innovation is not their only goal. Their, their goal is to also make money. Da, 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 da. Literally, like, upgrades to them, and especially in this world, um, they would rather have people pay for upgrades and pay for maintenance because there's also like a eugenics a eugenics agenda at hand here like they literally talk he literally the way he talks about rusty robots is like oh trash these wastes like he, they literally think they're burdens to society right because they're just not new anymore and i feel like that illustrates ageism and like disability politics as a whole like so well and articulately for like a ch like a ch audience of children right like you can literally see see how you know their like eugenicist mindset is employed in this very like utilitarian technocratic way right and like this guy he literally reminds me of elon musk he's voiced by i can't remember it's like paul something but like you know sleazy car salesman all that right literally and cars, his main yeah. goal is fully literally cars like and his main goal is profit cars his like he looks like a tesla he literally looks like a tesla that's true, right? Like, and the yeah, he's also like the skin, the metal plug. It, it's it's a it was a very um, what's it called? Like like the futuristic design that they enabled was truly the one that it came to be in real life. You know what I mean? Like the sort of like yeah, gray, colorless, sleek, minimalist aesthetic. Oh, crazy! Oh my god, I the like degree is buzzing. That. And here's the other part, too. When we consider the fact that, like, parts are people in this society, that they are taking, like, literal live robots. There's scenes where they're chopping up, like, partially live robots and taking, effectively, their organs, right, to make new parts to sell to people. This is, like, Soylent Green on freaking crack. Like, this is, this is, like, and, you know, I was reading um, an opinion piece from somebody on this who was talking about this, too. And they were like, oh, well, it makes sense in their society, like, clearly. And I'm like, no, like, the way that the robots react in the movie, like, it, it felt like the person didn't even um, 
watch the movie. I should have linked their article and talked about it more, but I didn't have time and I wanted to film. So, you know, um, like the robots react like her, they're horrified when they find out about this, you know, there's collective outrage. They can see like the, you know, immorality with this kind of decision, right? Like when they collectively find out towards the end of the film. So like, this is not like um, a thing that has widespread approval. They're just trying to manufacture consent through, um, you know, pushing up upgrades and withholding maintenance, right? Because once they don't sell the part anymore, the robot's just going to go there anyways. Like, I love this. Aunt Fanny and her rainbow co-op. Her gompy. <laughs> yes, I, I remember. <laughs> I almost put her rainbow polycule, but I was like, oh, well, they're not dating. I don't want to, like, <laughs> I don't want to joke about that. Girl, <laughs> so, I also love that all your but, images have, like, six pixels. Like, Thank you. I've been kind of obsessed with the <laughs> resolution. I, like, genuinely think it's funny. Like, Okay, you may continue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I think another important aspect of this movie is, uh, we'll go back to the color thing, too, because you brought up that, and, like, that's in my next slide as well. But color also casts, like, a very important dichotomy over this film where, like, you know, like, technocrat, like you said, like, all of the robots, even the love interest of Rodney, she's gray. She's voiced by Halle Berry. I can't remember her name. All gray-toned, you know, monotone. Even, like, the ad they're presenting in the boardroom meeting, um, it's very much so, like, mimicking iPhone and, like, Apple tech, right? Like, they were very much so, like, going off of the Silicon Valley aesthetic, right? Uh, when they were animating. That was a very intentional thing because Blue Sky Studios actually wasn't owned by any big conglomerates at the time or it may have been owned... It may have been independent with this film and then recently acquired by Fox. Don't quote me on that because it was owned by Fox before Disney absorbed them both. But it's not like there was like a super... Uh, like there wasn't a giant conglomerate behind this film. So we can't really, you know, say that like... We can't really give this credit to Disney, right? Like this kind of class analysis in a film, similar to like Chicken Run and how there's class analysis that can be derived from that, existed in like smaller like animation houses in like the early 2000s, right? Like they're, they're you know, they're definitely calling out, cap they're more likely to be calling out capitalism than current films or like pieces of animation would be, you know? It's also sure interesting probably because, oh. Yeah. No, See, it's also interesting that like again with the color thing in the sense of like that the dinky old robots are like bright red like even rodney yeah. is getting to be a little bit less colorful but still have definitely has like the bright blue but he's a lot of silver yeah. and earth tone and kind of stuff but then like um the old one whose name I've already forgotten, but Robin Williams is like bright red and black and very Fender. like Fender, very like high contrast. And then Fanny's got like blue eyeshadow, but robot version and like the bright yeah. red and the, and the makeup with like the super bright pink, like cheeks like mine right now. You know what I mean? So it's like the old <laughs> that kind of expo in her body, right? She looks like a smegma kettle or smegma girl. That's not the, Smeg. That's not the brand, is it? It's, it's just Smeg. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to keep that in for the fun. I love that for us. <laughs> Have good luck with that. The fucking Smeg. Incredible. Brand. No, it's Smeg. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> like that's the thing you can see that you can see. Listen, I'll turn it around. I'll turn it around. I've been. <laughs> you can see that, like how mm. their tech is inspired, right? Like you can see how this is more like of a 1950s, 1960s kind of technology versus like the new cutting edge upgrades that they're trying to do that are very like you know Y2K like end of the mo like this millennia you could see that sort of like millennial tech influence in the art for um like the villains in the movie i love her little rainbow co-op i also love that like he's like immediately taken in and not charged rent i think that that's a very intentional 
like plot point in the movie is that he's just like brought in. She also literally takes in rusted and broken robots. Like that is Aunt Fanny's whole thing. So like just really emphasizing the like pillar and of community that she's you know that's being created by like housing people i think is a very intentional point in the film and i think it's interesting Next because slide. when we think about this as a concept how much more surface level big studios were doing it because this is a very similar narrative yeah. structure to monsters university with the fraternity Literally. of loser old bitch that they had like the loser old people frat and then, which oh, was yeah. like the rusted robot taken in by the guy who had the bunks in his, his, like his mom put bunks in his room so that the fraternity could stay there, right? And it's like a 40-year-old mm -hmm. living with his mom or something. It's like that same concept, <laughs> but how much more superficial it is. Where that one, it was like, oh, your dreams aren't going to always be exactly what you thought, you know? But there's no, like, different treatment. I guess there's a little bit of sort of, like, disability conversations that could be had maybe because there's just like the one with two head with oh, all the eyes and there's like weird stuff with them but but like that. it's still way more like there's way more levels with this that are more than just like arbitrary i don't know anyway next yeah. slide i assume and, and more than just tropes like they're more than just a found family right and like they literally have a pride parade at the end of the film that's another thing i wanted to emphasize too Yay. is that like you know when we talk about like Another thing too, if you really want to do like um not only class analysis, but I can't get over Ron either. Yeah, literally. Okay. So... <laughs> okay. Me at the function. <laughs> His eyes too, they're not like matching the direction he should be looking in. Like, the artist kind of fumbled that one. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, but tying back into intersectionality, um, you know, marginalized groups are often associated with, like, color. If we talk about, like, white supremacy, literally, like, you know, anything that isn't white or neutral is often um, seen as, like, you know, that was the reason why a lot of African prints were considered, like, um, uh, infantile or primitive was because of all the bright colors, you know, like they um, historically were like uh, scrutinized by, you know, colonial entities like the British and the French, but like, you know, color in those indigenous and like African tribes meant so much more than just that, right? Like there was an intentional you know, color choice with the design of the robots, um, not just from the animators, but we can assume in the universe as a whole, right? Like you were saying, right? Like each of them, and like we're probably talking about with the smeg kettle, <laughs> um, their intentionality with their design, and we can see that there's intentionality and in design in the universe with the concept of manufactured obsolescence, right? Like they are there. There is that thought process behind it. So, like much like our own technology in our current world, you know, um, we went from having really colorful, fun technology um, to like very sleek, like very like, and you know uh that's intentional you know like they're trying to sell a certain sort of like placid minimalist you know in uh design style because that's what they've been told will be the most marketable right but to combat the main crux of the plot which is you know the lack of they also the main inventor big weld in the world nowhere to be found they don't know where he is right like you know the technocrat villain has asserted himself as the main how like he's the ceo of big weld industries which is officially also like not only is this guy jeff bezos this guy controls all of their health care essentially right because you know Galen. he's inventing yeah like which is what Galen bezos is trying to do right getting yeah a core Galen op Weston. if you're not oh. a real one you won't understand galen weston Honestly, in minecraft bro girl oh <laughs> Galen West in Minecraft. So what? So what is what does Rodney start doing after he's not? He can't find Big Well. He's just one robot. He's done everything. He's tried to infiltrate the system himself. The system rejected him, even though he was a pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of worker, right? This guy climbed a literal building, right? What does he do? Does he give up? Does he go on Twitter.com and complain? No. 
He does mutual aid, fixing robots, repairs, part manufacturing. If he can't find the parts, he's making them and DIYing them himself. And you know what? Because of that, other robots start fixing each other, right? We were at a potential point where robots were going to be potentially cannibalizing each other and stealing each other's parts because of a lack of upgrades. This guy said, no. We're not going to turn on each other. There is solidarity in our collectivity. He got together with the robot masses. And then, you know what? Everybody was on their side. Everybody was like, yeah, you know what? That Rodney guy, he fixed my friend. He fixed my cousin. I can live because this guy, you know, like we, they, they start, that's how you start a revolution. That is how you engage with people. You, you, you do it through mutual aid and interaction in real life. Even if you're a robot, right? Next slide. <laughs> We teach a class. Leave Honestly. A I'm going to start selling no, we don't classes. See, we don't need capital. We need to watch robots. We don't I'm, need to read capital. We need to watch robots. Capital was also like really hard to read. <laughs> like, actually, it's that one so wasn't, wasn't bad. Like, what was I, the other one? There was the ones with three volumes. Is that not Capital? Dog, I took Yeah. Yeah. So those are the ones that are really hard to read. I had to read one for. Yeah. Um, Dog. I had to read one for I indigenous just, studies class. Really? Or for, I had, I had a based. course on my last, it was a poli-sci class, experimental, it was called Experimental mm -hmm. Course Code, so it was just unnamed kind of for the most part. And then he named it at the end, I can't remember what it was. But it was, uh, it was like the business of colonialism or something. Talked about Palestine, talked about Africa, talked about Ghana and Haiti and uh, the revolutions in Mexico uh, we talked about, and then we had to read Capital and learn about um, primitive Ooh. accumulation and everything like that, and what that concept was. And then he recommended the course book for that was Traces of History by Patrick Wolf, which has the uh, Palestine oh. essay that I always recommend people read when they, when, when I tell them, like, if you can't read it, honestly, like, just copy paste the text into, like, an AI thing and just be, like, simplify the concept and it will help have a starting point. Mm -hmm. And then you can bounce back and forth between the reading if it's too conceptually difficult because those are pretty heavy. And a lot mm. of people are not able to properly articulate a lot of the thoughts in there. AI was can't really either, but I think it's if that's your barrier, like at least get your toe in kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that course was iconic and very that guy was incredibly based. Like I remember based. the last day of classes, oh, he ripped a vape like five feet out of the doll out of the out of the building and blew it at a kid. <laughs> Wait, you I was like, kid? Yeah, and I was like, this is awesome. That was my last day of my undergraduate degree. I'm so serious. That was my last class I had on my last day at Waterloo. That was my um, last class. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and then I walked off the campus and went home, moved out like, or moved away like 10 days later. It was very epic. Peace. Anyway, <laughs> oh, that's like one of my only oh. fond memories of my undergrad. Was the last day. <laughs> I was going to say, um, oh, on Capital, I took a whole class on Marx and Hegel, right? Because I feel like you can't read Marx without reading Hegel. Because Hegel's master-slave dialectic, even though he's a huge racist, it provides a lot of context for class analysis. I mean, most philosophers are racist. Like, any, any white philosopher, man, 9 out of 10 chance he's a racist. 9 out of 10 chance. Anyways. <laughs> are we at next slide? But, yeah. And that's the thing. I feel like really good i actually wanted to talk about that how there's definitely like you could definitely do like an intersectional race analysis of this but i am probably not the person to do that but you could definitely like somebody could definitely do a really good analysis of the dichotomy of color versus gray and white supremacy for anybody who wants to take that idea and roll with it absolutely because i'm probably not the person for that but there is somebody out there who would knock it out of the park i also love oh so they finally find him right the part I love about this is like tear down your heroes a little bit because when he meets him, this guy couldn't give less of a, of a, of a heck about anybody. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about the state of anybody else. He's an exhausted, like he's like, Oh, woe is me. I don't have passion about innovation anymore. Blah, blah, blah. And you know, Rodney's like, okay, well people are dying, right? Like people are dying without you. Like quite literally, like you got to do something like you got to go back in there and take over your company because you're the actual boss of this company. Like you got to seize the means of production. And I think that this really illustrates like, actually it ties into Marx and Hegel really well, the master slave dichotomy, right? Where 
the dichotomy of the master and slave is that the master obviously controls, if we're talking about like Romans, right? You've got like a Lord who can control all the money and then the worker who's doing all the work. Marx took that analysis and applied it to class and society and then invented the entirety of sociology. God tier shit. Apply that analysis to like a boss and a worker, right? And this specifically right here. The boss is like, yeah, I have all the power, but I don't want to wield it. Like, And the other part too is that there's a high level of alienation between the two. Rodney actually interacts with the working class on a daily basis. This guy's sitting away, hiding in a tower, playing dominoes. He does not see the problems of the workers because he's not, he's alienated from them. And I that remember is the, those the dominoes. Crucial... They're really yeah. nice dominoes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I remember. That's yeah. Awesome. And that's a crucial point in the movie, right? Is that like, you know, like Rodney knows how to solve the problem he's just limited by the his lack to, to power big weld has all the power he just has the lack of will right he has a he doesn't want to and it ties into like worker alienation as well like workers understand the means of production by the master right like rodney understands how the system of their society works better than fucking big well does he doesn't care that it's medicine for people he didn't even fathom to think beyond that right because again he's alienated he has all the wealth power he doesn't he's not whether intentionally or not he is isolated from society to a point that it's almost like the banality of the upper class right like sometimes they're just like how Par parasite illustrates it right like where um for those who haven't seen parasite this is also a spoiler uh there's a huge rainstorm right? And the poor family is like devastated. Their home floods. They have to sleep in a stadium with other refugees who've like taken shelter from the flood. Meanwhile, the other family's like, oh, it was just a storm. Yeah, just a little bit of rain last night. And the guy in the front seat is like just a bit of rain and he's like raging. Like that's where the parasite meme came from, right? Alienation happens whether it's intentional or not. And that sort of ignorance is for the upper class enraging to the lower class because like how can you just be so out of touch when it comes to the problems that the rest of society is facing right like you do not have these problems but just because you're not experiencing them doesn't mean that the rest of the world isn't suffering <laughs> yeah and the other part too is that like they really show him as like you know they leave and they're like oh wow whatever and then he eventually comes and is like, you know what? No, I'm, he comes to, and partly because of Aunt Fanny, like, we ain't gonna lie. Like, he did it. He did it for a bit of that ass. Like, you know, he did. He really did. But you know what? Never underestimate the power of a bodacious woman. Overall, through the collective action of overthrowing the, cap the venture capitalists, are they able to mend society for the betterment of everyone? and all of robot kind, right? You know, because even at the end of the film, so, you know, they all band together and they all tear it down. Um, when the initial like rainbow robot crew is fighting the villains, they're almost on the brink of losing. And it isn't until the rest of the robots like band together and outnumber the rich upper class robots and like the chop shop lady, I can't remember her name. She's also kind of a queen, like her eyebrows are kind of, like, even though she's, like, literally committing, like, murder, like, her eyebrows are pretty cool. But that's the thing. They come together, and they that's literally how they get... It's through the collective action, right? Like, and, like, the big weld, like, ping pong, Ru, you know, Rube Goldberg sort of, like, robot style. I don't know. Like, there's... At one point, they're riding his body, right? And, like, knock over the villain. But it's through everybody doing their part that they're able to achieve the robot revolution, right? All right. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. Next slide. Or whatever Karl Marx said or whatever. Next slide. Each yeah. Oh Karl boy. Marx. Capital. Yeah. Lord That's help us. That's literally what he said. This ties into necropolitics because, and according to Wikipedia, because I, I didn't want to cite my course notes because I didn't want to commit copyright infringement. Oh, I I but, always um, just cite the notes. I just yeah. don't like put their slides on screen. Oh, well, I didn't save their slides to begin with. It's notes I took. Well, I guess if it's notes I took personally, it's different. I don't know. I didn't want to get in I trouble for that. academic content. Right? So I just cited Wikipedia. But this, honestly, I think 
Wikipedia is always a good starting point for research. You know, you can find other sources. I linked one of the sources that I found from Wikipedia. I think. Um, but it's also a good starting point to hard academic concepts that are gatekept by six grand a course. I have genuinely probably so like probably like put on YouTube for free through my videos half of my mm -hmm. Schmunder Schmaduich Mishmri from Schmutter Schmoo <laughs> Schmu University in Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Like well that contextualized through like cool. something else. You know what I mean? But like I just restructured mm -hmm. it a little bit. Which I think which is still fair use and adaptive. But I definitely like it was all stuff I learned there. Like anyway, mm. continue, my lady. My lady. <laughs> my lady. Um, but in necropolitics, um, it's basically a socio-political theory and an extension of like Marx. You know, it goes like Marx, Foucault, and structuralists. And then necropolitics is actually a pretty relatively new term. It's a postmodern term. Yeah, it's basically the socio-political theory of the use of social and political power to dictate how some people may live and some people may die. Mm. Personally, I think necropolitics is all politics because so much of our bodies are commodified when we think about like one of the biggest like examples of that. We can think of, you know, abortion and access to birth control. You know, we're determining who gets to live and who gets to die. Um and people should rightly have that bodily autonomy. So I personally think necropolitics extends to all politics because most politics involve the body because politics is of the people and people uh, inhabit bodies I, or, you know, whatever. We're, mm -hmm, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. I remember fighting with, <laughs> not fighting, but I remember arguing with a researcher when I was in graduate school mm -hmm. about my social media job. Because she was like, mm -hmm. you should not have much of a social media presence. You need to hide your data through X, Y, Z, da, 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 da. And I was like, okay, but like, mm -hmm. I'm commodifying my personality instead of my body and my time and, yeah. and my personality and my standpoints and most of the things I stand for, really, to represent somebody else. I was like, the, yeah, the commodity is like, oh, I have to tell people I like Minecraft. Like, it's like, okay, you know, or I have to deal with ridicule that might be a mm -hmm. bit more hyper specific than if I'm in a retail position, for example. But again, cost to benefit here is a little bit, you know, in favor of a position like this one. And that's why a lot of people are like, shut your mouth when a YouTuber complains about their job. Right. Which mm -hmm. I understand. I, and I understand that there are some, you know, distinctly unique points such as those, like the way that like someone can harass you and find you in every, in a lot of different ways and can like endanger you in very specific, you like unique ways. Like someone who's like mad at you at a retail store, can't really get your address. There's like protections that are lost. Well, but for the majority, mm. most people don't face those things even in the first place. A lot of those like safeties are, are like a lot of those issues can kind of come down to like what you've antagonized. And even then, most people are fine when that happens. There are very select few that have been put in significant danger. It's just interesting because of like the concept of the commodity. It's like, well, I can at least have a creative outlet as the commodity that also allows me to like work more or work less depending on my capacities. Sometimes I do two videos in a live stream in a week. Sometimes I just do a live stream in a week. Sometimes I just do a video in a week. Sometimes I don't do anything for two weeks, right? It's like, it it is what it is, you know? It's kind of cool to think about as a concept, but also a little bit like just like, disturbing in the concept of like if i wasn't commodifying myself this way what do i what else would i be doing you know so exactly right like it, it's the same argument that you know some more uh pseudo moralist leftists like to make about sex work nine times out of ten they're just being swerfs where 
or, you know, rad femmes who are just very sex work exclusionary, you know, they try and talk about that and how, you know, that com kind of commodification like sexually is different. And it's like, is it really that different than being a mother or a trad wife though? Truly, because that's what Dworkin was talking about when she was writing. And like, that's what the whole like non-transphobic and non-sex um, work exclusionary rad femme position is right is like is liberating women from all of those choices and like non-men from all of those choices right like from the coercion of sex period right because you know even if you aren't being coerced into sex work how many women in offices have been harassed and coerced you know to get like higher positions like how many women get harassed in their retail jobs you know like sexual harassment is an exclusive it was literally a common work. trope. Remember, yeah. like, how Forrest Gump didn't get put into, like, the school for handicapped children? His mom sucked off the principal. His, okay, Forrest Gump. Forrest got not high enough in the IQ ranking. Mm -hmm. So to bribe the principal into letting him into the regular program, she had sex with the, his mom had sex with the principal. Yeah. That's in the plot of Forrest Gump. Oh. Like, one of the yeah. most like commonly seen movies and famous movies in like, n like at least kind of at least thing. west like north american culture at least there's almost that like disdain for sex work almost arises from the fact that like sex workers are the ones that are actually like making men pay for sex right because men like sex is used like you know because that's the thing like men want sex women are the ones that can say yes or no Right. Like we are the ones who are like giving consent to sex ideally. Right. Like that's the thing. People have disdain for sex workers because sex work is almost like I don't want to say it's like a black pill, but it's like looking misogyny right in the eye and grabbing it and saying, yeah, I know that you want to I know what you want. I know you want to objectify me. I know you want to like and, and you know what? You know, it's taking it back on your own terms in that regard, at least. But really, nobody has any freedom in a capitalist system when it comes to work. Like, we all have to work. That's ideally, like, that's why we should strive to have no work be coerced, ideally, right? Like, or, you know, you shouldn't have to work to survive. Everybody has to work to live unless you're disabled and can't work, right? Yeah, like, people, you know... Anyways, it ties into necropolitics in that regard. And um, I actually was happy to do a little bit more research on Achille. I can't, I can't remember the pronouncing, like, pronunciation of his last name. But um, he's a Cameroonian historian. And he talks about how different forms of political violence impose social or civil death. Um, he talks about, like, you know, how colonial nations have, uh, you know, utilized or just nations in general and how they'll uh, determine who has rights and who doesn't. Um, it also ties into like how nations choose to expose their citizens to mortal danger and death. Like if we talk about the pandemic, that's necropolitics. Like how all of our like governments chose to handle that, that's necropolitics. Like Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Justin Trudeau, all of the politicians choosing to, you know, not be honest about COVID regulations or like, you know, choosing to like reopen, you know, early. I don't think Trudeau actually did that. I think that's more of a Doug Ford thing if I'm thinking more about Canada, but like we're talking about national leadership, like both Trump and Biden have fumbled the bag with the pandemic entirely. You know, like it was a failing on parts, you know, like co people are still suffering with COVID. Like it's literally, you know, it's a form of necropolitics because, you know, the government is choosing whether they are intentionally doing it or not. They're choosing um, who to expose to death and who not to, you know, and most of those people are, you know, people who've been doing essential work and other vulnerable people, right? Or I should say vulnerable groups of people. But yeah, it's usually women, people of color, disabled people, old people, you know, these are people who make up a majority of service work jobs. That is why so much of the conversation around service work is monopolized around like, oh, it doesn't need to be a living wage. It's because a lot of these jobs aren't actually held by high school students. And it's been that way for a long time. They're held by women. They're held by, you know, um, people of color. They're held by disabled people. They're held by elderly people. That's why they try and justify not raising these wages, because that's a majority of the people in those workspaces. But yeah, 
Uh, next real. slide. <laughs> yeah. yeah, real. <laughs> real. No, it's true. It's, and that ties into necropolitics, too. And we think about robots as well in their class system. Like, you know, yeah. So, and, and necropolitics as a whole, like I was saying, it's derived from Foucault. So Foucault talks about biopower. And biopower refers to more of that nation state. So biopower, um, Foucault was analyzing how, you know, nation states exercise power over their populations, right? Um, it's a technology of power and it relates to controlling people. Whereas like, you know, um, necropolitics is an extension of that. And it's more so focusing on um, who has that power and how it's wielded rather than simply um, who has a right to kill. And then, yeah, like just further building off of that, it's, um, yeah, so what this is, it's talking about, so necropolitics almost talks about how the material conditions can manipulate death, right? Like, and through like willful or in, um, you know, like willful action um, or uh, unintentional action, you know, like you can still have people dying through the banality of bureaucracy, right? Like, and that's, you know, what was happening at the end of the day with the pandemic, right? Like, they know at the end of the day, some disabled people are going to die. And that's just, if that's the sacrifice, you know, they need to make to maintain the machine of capitalism, so be it. Almost in the sense, like with robots, they know that some robots are going to die to make new parts for the machine, like for their machines in their world. They know, and that's a sacrifice they're willing to make. It's the utilitarian perspective, right? Where they're like, well, it's for the collective good. But is it for the collective good if, you know, everybody is also like if most people are suffering because, you know, while the first older units would die in that world versus like, you know, disabled people are the first to die with COVID. What are the long term ramifications of both of these like because circumstances, of the, right? Because of the Vosh thing, I've had to teach so many people what utilitarianism means. Because <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's not even right. On my stream, it's called what he was talking about. It's called rule consequentialism. But anyway, yeah. it made me laugh because I was just like, "Good God, I have to like be a philosophy teacher." Anyways, also, is it the next slide? Um, hmm. It says it the oh. Oh no, that's the end of it. But yeah, just to round off, like that's the thing, right? Is like when we talk about robots, they were willing to sacrifice all of those disabled and broken robots to make new parts. And in our society, they're casting aside disabled people, elderly people, you know, to make they're they're like, okay, who cares? But at the cost of like healthcare for the rest of the robots, right? Like once you have no workers, or once you have workers who are disabled from COVID and long COVID, what's going to happen to the system of capitalism? And sooner rather than later, we have to band together and honestly like because that's the thing i've become pretty disillusioned with a lot of electoral politics like i'm still gonna vote for the party or representatives i think will do the best job i don't think complete civil disengagement is the solution but uh it shouldn't be your only focus and mutual aid through co and collective action is we can accomplish so much through all of that case in point robots and you know what i think i'll just like round that off this will be my la like my thesis. There's a reason why robots were able to unionize and unify before humans were able to, and that's because they were willing to put aside some aesthetic differences. And that's all. I'll say. <laughs> you know, bro. Of course, tech would unify before. I I used to say that all the time to my grandma. I'm like, oh, I feel like the robots will have a revolution before we do, and I think robots is a perfect. Uh, encapsulation of that sentiment. Thanks for listening to my special interest rant. <laughs> and of course, I cited my sources. I cited Wikipedia. Illuminati would never. Not in the video, anyway. Okay. No. Just had like the twentieth citation on the Google Doc. <laughs> All right. So now I can excellent. A lot of thank you. Very interesting conversation. I was eating noodles at the end because I've been at my computer for like nine hours today. And, um, huh. Yeah, I guess it, was, it makes me, I guess, I don't think about my children's movies like that critically that often. Um, because I just like don't care to usually. Now watch Chicken thinking about, Run. Thinking about like Up. I'm thinking about like Chicken Little. Uh-huh. 
Chicken, Chicken Little. Oh my Chicken god! Chicken Little like, is like a a play on like um the Rapture, right? Like the concept of the Rapture, isn't it? More or less. It's like the isn't sky's it aliens? falling. Well, the sky's falling. The world is ending. You know, like. Chicken Little is Revelations. Yo, is that the next? Yeah. Is that the next? <laughs> well, I'm saying that like it's obvious and you're an idiot if you don't think Chicken Little is Revelations. Anyway. I haven't seen Chicken Little in like literally 20 years since it probably came out. Oh man, goaded movie. Goated I think, movie. well, I'm trying to think of my other fa- I liked Bolt, that, you know, in that same time not frame. Atlantis. even in the same time, not even in the same fucking league as Chicken Little. Bolt. Be for real. Be uh, no, serious like, I for a minute. like it. Like, like. <laughs> mm-hmm. It okay. was just like, I was like, oh, it's cute. It's a dog. You know, it's background music I can put on, or background noise I can put on while I hang with my Chicken cousins. Chicken Little had yeah. a giant pig character that stuffed himself in a yes. tiny little car. And he helped the kids get to the place to intercept the aliens so the world was okay. And then Chicken Little in Chicken Little gets adapted into a movie called Chicken Little. And they get like a big beefy celebrity chicken to play Chicken Little. So Chicken Little's like shredded and ripped and gigantic in the Chicken Little movie that they show at the end of Chicken Little in real life. It's awesome. It's a good movie. Disney Plus. So I guess I have something to watch. I don't have Disney Plus, unfortunately. It's like the only one that I did like saw my soul to. I have like Discovery well, can- and Crave and uh, Paramount Plus because I wanted to watch South Park. <laughs> so this is where we end our little return episode. I hope y'all liked it. And links for everything will be in the description, including Elle's um, socials as she whatever ones she wants. And then I will also link my PowerPoint as a file for y'all to utilize if you so desire. And then we'll talk about Jeffree Star probably as long as nothing crazy happens in the next week which I always say something like that I have a video planned like that there's so many I feel like there's so many in the ether of my end of my conclusions that like I mentioned that I'm gonna do and then something nuts happens like the Colleen Ballinger ukulele video or something and it just never happens so this was just a fun little video kind of in between my bigger videos something I would like to do a little more often too along with my streaming whimmies so you kids have a great day wherever you are and I guess we'll see you when we see you. Bye. Oh my God, you're free. Yay! Welcome back, my king. Well, you did commit horrendous tortures. Yes, yes, yes. Calm down, you barbarian! I'm in an Uber! Put Uber driver on the phone! Put him on the phone! No, please stop! I won't let you hurt him! Okay, darling, well, your location will do. I oblige, my lord. Okay, just know, daddy's back from jail, and he's coming for you! Worship me. <laughs> <laughs>